Cool Hand Podcast, something you got to deal with. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host. My name is Q. We have a special guest in the building. Um, let me tell y'all something. I was introduced to this guest through uh, a very visionary person, somebody who puts things together in various ways, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So that's the first time I was introduced to our guest today. Then one day I got like a notification on Instagram, like, I forget exactly what it was, but this sister said, hey, so-and-so, is this your friend? And I'm like, it was like some funny, I forget what it was, but it was somebody who looked like me. I'm like, okay. you all look just alike. At least like from what I saw, what I've seen on you on Instagram, you look just like that person. Now that I'm like in front of you on a computer screen, you really don't look that much alike but I thought you did at first. I thought it was hilarious. I can't remember what it was, but I just remember getting a kick out of it. So guest, please introduce yourself. I am Morgan. Nice to meet you. I'm from Tennessee. Morgan from Tennessee. Thank you for being on the show today. Um, Tennessee, this is a state that I don't know too much about. Before we get into, uh, you know, the real meat and potatoes of the episode, I want to give whoever may not know you or any new viewers or listeners a chance to get to know Morgan and you got a lot going on by the way I did my research so um what what's Tennessee what was life like um growing up there um it was pretty cool for the most part I um I was actually born in a really small town in Arkansas so that's where my earliest memories were um we lived in the sticks Um, I remember dirt roads, riding my bike on those with my dad all the time. We were always doing something together and exploring. So that was pretty cool. Shortly afterwards, we moved to California. Um, We were there until I was about maybe six or seven. And then we moved to Memphis, Tennessee, where um, that's where I spent most of my life. Um, Growing up in Memphis, it was definitely different than what I was used to. Um, There wasn't as much to do there as there was in like California or was like right before um there was also like a lack of uh what's the word that I'm thinking of like California is kind of like a melting pot everybody from like all different kinds of cultures they all come together there but Memphis is mostly like black and white so that was pretty different to see coming back um but it was it was really cool. I met a lot of great people growing up. So <clears throat> California till six or seven, right? Mm-hmm. And then we would go back and forth. But you were young enough to realize that it was a melting pot. Um, yeah. Young enough to really notice the difference between Cali and uh, Memphis, Tennessee. So when I think Memphis, um, maybe because... I'm into hip hop and stuff. I think of like Young Dolph, Yo Gotti. (laughs) Um, I don't think of, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't think of a lot of great things. I don't like, I I just think of hood. I just think of hood stuff. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. That's how it is. Actually, um, I'm, let's see. I have connections to Yo Gotti, actually. My cousins are cousins with Yo Gotti's kids, if that makes sense. <laughs> so your cousins are cousins with Yo Gotti's kids. It makes sense. Yeah, it does so we're sense. all around each other. Okay. Mm-hmm. So so people shouldn't play with you, should they? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um so yeah don't don't play with Morgan because she's <laughs> she's connected in the city. Okay, so what were you doing in Memphis uh, when you guys got over there? Like, what did you do as a youngin? What were you guys into? Um, you mentioned doing stuff with your dad. What else? Um, uh, let's see. What did I mostly do when I was in Memphis? Aside from school, um, I mean, I, w- I lived a pretty sheltered life. Like, th- you said, watch out for me. I really, I don't, I don't have any ops. Um, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not about that life. I was homeschooled, okay? Um, okay. Um, I, I would say I spent most of my time with my cousins and um, our dads. We were always, like, four-wheeling. Um, we would get the four-wheelers and go down to 
Um, so there was like this little forest that you could get to um, off the highway. So we would go down into there and we would go riding through the forest and everything. And that was super cool. Um, bike riding, kid stuff, you know, like building forts in the backyard, climbing trees, exploring, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then me and my dad's things, um, specifically our thing was music. We loved finding different artists together and listening to different people. So, um, I always tell people like, I get my, I get, I get my music taste mostly from my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much what I did growing up. Mm-hmm. And that's a good segue because, uh, I talk about music on the podcast. I love music. Matter of fact, what do you like what did your dad introduce you to so on and so forth my dad introduced me to uh let's see what are some of the main people portishead um boards of canada atb which is like electronic music um there's this one group i still love them to this day um their name is bent um they have this album called aerials that me and my dad will listen to a lot. And that's still to this day an album that I can play through without any skips. It's just, it's it's beautifully done. Um, some other people that he put me on to, oh, Massive Attack. I'm sure you probably heard of them. They were really big yeah. in the 90s. That's mm-hmm. interesting. So you're, uh, your dad now, outside of Massive Attack and Portishead, I have not heard of the other groups or people but um, there's somebody uh, who's been on the show. His name is Johnny, who's like a dad to me. It sounds like your dad and him have very similar uh, music yeah. taste. So hopefully he watches the episodes. Hope- hopefully when he sees this, um, he could agree or disagree. But um, that's pretty cool. So as you get older, all right, um, what genre styles did you become uh, partial to or what did you like more? Um, gosh, I'm not the best when it comes to genre judgment. I pretty much just listen. I'm like, I like this. I don't know what it is, but I like it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say I gravitated to a lot of maybe electronic house music. Um, I remember growing up, I was really into Dead Mouse and cascade they have some really good i I guess you would consider them house music i don't know but Mm -hmm. whatever that is i I definitely was partial to it gotcha and you are um from the the little bit of research that i'm able to do and i always tell people the extent of my research on people is their instagram accounts uh Uh, so you gave me a lot to work with thank you by the way (laughs) so i noticed that uh you had a story and do you play some guitar? Yeah, I do. I started learning. I picked it up initially when I was 12, but I never stuck with it. My guitar sucked. I, <laughs> My very first guitar, I remember my grandmother, I begged her to get it for me. And it was at Aldi. I don't know if you know what Aldi is. Do you have them out there? I go there every payday, sister. Every I payday. I love Aldi. <laughs> But they had guitars and they were only, they were under a hundred bucks. And so my grandmother got me one, but I knew nothing about guitars um, and I didn't know where to go to find out about them. So all I knew was that it was extremely hard to play um, because the strings were just, they were really, really crappy strings. Um, So I tried my best to like get accustomed to it and like um, build up my calluses and everything, but like it was killing my fingers so bad. I just, after a few months, I just put it down. And it's funny because like I would have people um, come over to the house and visit and they saw that I, I had a guitar. So they were like, oh, can I play it? And I was like, yeah. So I give it to them and they <laughs> try to play. And it's like, oh my God, why are your strings <laughs> so hard? <laughs> and I'm like, see, okay, it's not just me. Um, so eventually I, um, bought a new guitar and that was 2020. Cause I was like, well, I ain't got nothing better to do. Um, actually I borrowed a friend's guitar hmm. and that's when I started learning again. And because it was the pandemic, you know, we were on, um, reduced hours for work. Um, I had a lot of time on my hand. So I remember I would practice for like six to eight hours a day. Um, 
Yeah. So I was able to progress a good bit um, pretty fast. That was pretty cool to see. Um, I know, you know, Jayla and everything. She taught me a lot. She would give me pointers here and there. Um, And yeah, unfortunately, like once we started going outside a little bit more, um, the guitar started gathering dust. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, now I'm trying to pick it up again. uh, But now like circumstances are different. You know, we have other things that we're doing now. And yeah. Yeah. It's it's hard to maintain a hobby when life is going on. Mm-hmm. When life is lifing. Yeah. 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 And I'm in school now, too. So that's taking up a lot of my time. Oh, wow. What are you in school for? Software engineering. Oh, you're smart. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have a genius in the building. Oh my god. <laughs> All right. So um you sounded good when I listened to the uh when I listened to, you know, some of the, some of the string work you were doing. So, you know, hopefully if time ever permits, you could pick that back up because the Cool Hand podcast loves musicians. So, um some other stuff. Some other stuff as we get to know Morgan today. You have been around states, cities, countries. Mhm. Tell us about your traveling and your interests in that regard. Uh, so my interest in traveling started when I was maybe eight years old. I just, I, there was a show that I used to watch on PBS Kids called Sagwa, the Chinese Siamese cat. And like, <laughs> after I watched that, I was like, you know what? One day I'm going to move to China and I'm going to become the emperor's daughter. And that was my goal. And so (laughs) when I got older, I, um, that's all I did. Like I just started traveling and I couldn't stop. And now I probably go somewhere just about every month. Wow. So, okay, let's, let's just take this step by step. So (laughs) where let's just, you're in Tennessee. I'm going to assume you've been to a lot of States, right? Yeah. Okay. So we're just going to leave the States out of this. Okay regards to the different countries or continents you've visited can you uh give us some some game on that um like what my maybe my favorite place that i've been to or Let, let's 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 list them off how many countries and continents where have you been not many um canada if you really want to count it um nicaragua Guatemala on this side of the world and Asia. I've been to Japan a few times, Taiwan. I think that's it for Asia, for Europe, France, Ireland. I think that's it for Europe, but I'm going to more places this year. She said not that many places. Yeah. You've been to, (laughs) (laughs) you've been to a lot of countries. So that that's pretty cool to be able to see the world. Um, you know, a, one of one of our home girls from South Africa said when she got to the States, like she can understand why Americans see things with such a narrow viewpoint mm-hmm. because it's just like America and everything else. But being able to see the the world and other people's cultures other people's societies what people do is pretty cool so what have you learned through traveling Uh, i learned that even though cultures can be really different everybody is more or less the same like girls are still girls guys are still guys no matter where you go i find that a lot of us all have like the same issues and problems in life. And I don't know, it kind of makes me feel closer to people. Yeah. Okay. And your favorite place that you visited? Japan, for sure. That's one place I cannot leave it alone. I keep telling myself every single year, okay, we're not going to go back to Japan, we have to try a different place. And so I try, but then I just wind up going back to Japan anyway. Mm -hmm. So 
I love and, Japan. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I was getting from uh, seeing some of your pictures. Uh, it it looks like uh, Japan is your place to be. So, mm -hmm. what specifically about Japan, the Japanese culture, do you like? Do you love so much? Uh, well, my interest in Japan started because of the food. And honestly, I would still say that's a pretty big part of my interest. Like, I love to eat. It doesn't really show that much on me if you see me in person, but I, I love to eat. Um, and they have the best food. And I love how clean it is. It's not so greasy. Like, in America, I'm used to greasy food, which is nice. I like greasy food sometimes. I love butter. But sometimes it's nice to just, like, eat something and not feel so weighed down afterwards. Um, so that's, that's Japanese food for you. And then I love seafood. They, they're on the ocean and they fish for everything. So mm. you have some really interesting foods there. I've tried sea, ur sea urchin for the first time over there. Okay. Um, that was good. I didn't know that you could eat sea urchin, but you can. It's actually the row inside of the sea urchin. Yeah, but it's really good. Um, Interesting. Yeah, that's probably my number one thing about Japan. And with let's let's stay with Japan for a, a little bit longer. So, uh, what else about? Because I'm I'm looking at some of these pictures. These you know these aesthetically pleasing pictures. It looks like the scenery, the the drinks. Um, yeah. Like what? What else about Japan? Because I got a friend, um, one of my friends, Tevin. He's been to Japan, I think, twice at this point. He and his wife, mm -hmm. and like they, they just like it there. They just. What would you say to somebody like myself who has never been and they're on the fence about going? What can you sell me on? Hmm. I feel like if you're on the fence about going. I would say go just to experience theme parks mm. and themed restaurants because, I mean, I don't think it really matters who you are. You probably like Mario. Who doesn't like Mario? <laughs> so, like, their Universal Studios is the bomb, and they have Super Mario World there. So you can go, and it's like you're actually in the video game. I would say just go for that, if nothing else. That's wow. a cool experience. Okay. And then... They have themed restaurants too. So anything that you can find any interest in, like I like animals a lot. So I went to a micro pig cafe where you can get some coffee. Then you can also pet micro pigs and hold them and stuff. I went to a puppy cafe. Um, they have ferret cafes, meerkat cafes. I went to an owl cafe, got to hold baby owls. Like wow. go for that. You're either going to be into Super Mario or you're into animals. That's interesting. And I'll tell you what, because if you were to ask me, I'd say I'd never have to see Japan. I, mm -hmm. I, but you, you kind of sold me on it uh, because I do, I do love animals um, in terms of Mario. That's cool. I, I rock with Mario. That's, that's my little homie too, but <laughs> animals, you know, I like animals a lot. So that's, pretty cool and owl specifically oh um, really yes i don't know why <laughs> don't ask me why but i like owls so uh okay so let's we're still going to talk about you a little bit more because you did mention the food um it looks like you throw down in the kitchen am i right or am i wrong i don't know about throwing down but i like trying out recipes that's something that i modest. um yeah that's my favorite pastime <laughs> So have you always been a, a chef, a cook? Because just let's just keep it real. It doesn't come naturally to people. And sometimes people just aren't interested in learning how to cook or cook well. Mm -hmm. Um, Honestly, I can't even tell you if it comes naturally to me or not. It depends on the day. Like, I am a firm believer in that in order to do something and make it good, you have to love it. It doesn't matter what it is. Some days I truly do not feel like cooking and it shows because if you taste the food, it's crap. Um, but like when I'm really into it and I'm excited about it, that's when it tastes good. So it, it depends on what day you catch me on. But during the pandemic, 
I was really excited about being able to, I mean, I didn't have anything to do. So I would just go down the list of all the recipes that I saved on Pinterest over the years. And I was just trying each and every single one of them out. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of fun. I actually even, um, I started an Instagram just to have all my cooking stuff on that page. Um, And yeah, I I was actually talking with somebody about that again recently because I want to get back into it and post more recipes and everything. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, thank you for sharing. I got a couple more questions. I got like a, I got like a, a softball question. Then I got a little bit of a, a more personal question um, mm-hmm. regarding like 2020 and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I forgot to ask um, when it came to Japan, uh, do you speak any languages? Yeah, I do speak Japanese. I started learning when I was um, maybe about 12 years old. And uh, only thing about that, I really didn't have much structure to what I was to my curriculum Um, I'm very much a, I see something that I want to do and I go hard on it. Mm -hmm. And so like, I, I was learning, but I was also studying for like six hours a day, eight hours a day. See, there I go with like those long hours putting time in. But the thing about that, since I wasn't pacing myself, I would get burnt out after about six months and then I wouldn't want to speak at all. So Once I realized that about myself, I started learning things about myself during 2020 was when I was a little bit more strategic in how I went about learning. Um, And I passed one of my language proficiency tests. Um, There's like five different levels. I passed one, maybe a little bit, I would say in 2021, I think it was 2021, I passed the first one. And then um, I skipped the, the second and I'm working on taking the third sometime this year. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. So I'm assuming you can hold a conversation. Yeah, depending on what we're talking about. Like one of my favorite moments that I had in Japan, me and my friend um, that I was traveling with, we were trying to head back home from this little um, ocean town. And we got on the wrong trains. They met up in the same place. Mm-hmm. Um So I wasn't worried or anything, but we were separated for a little while. And so um, I was keeping my eye on the map and everything. And then these little old Japanese ladies sat next to me. And so I just started speaking to them and they're like, oh, okay, you speak Japanese. That's so nice. How did you learn? And we had a good conversation. I just kind of told them about um, where I grew up and um, what made me want to learn Japanese in the first place. And they told me about their families where, where they grew up at and um, how their travels have been throughout their lives. And it was really cool. We had a good conversation. Um, yeah. <laughs> that is pretty cool. And what's it like? Uh, this this made me uh, think of something else. What's it like being black over there? Um, You know, I stayed in mostly touristy places for the most part. I went to, let's see. I went to the countryside maybe once, but it really wasn't a big deal. I mean, wherever I go, I get stairs anyway, and I'm used to that because I'm handicapped. Um, So you probably saw that in one of my photos, too. I have the crutches and everything. So I'm used to the stairs. um, But in regards to it being just because of, of me being black, I really didn't get that many stairs. But there are surprisingly a good amount of black people in Tokyo. Huh. Okay. All yeah. right. Because, you know, sometimes on social media, I feel you, of course, you can't believe everything you see on the internet, but mm-hmm. sometimes you see, I'm like, it can't be like this where somebody's in a different country and they're black. And then like they, you know, flip their phone camera and there's like a group of people just watching them eat because they're black. Now I'm not saying it does happen <laughs> and I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but that's why I wanted to ask you that question. Um, so uh, I, I just with all transparency, I'm like, do I, I, I think it's kind of rude just to say, I, I know I never met you a day in my life. This is the first time we spoke. Like, so uh, I noticed, you know, you're handicapped. So I, I wasn't sure if I was going <laughs> to, I wasn't going <laughs> to directly ask. I, I thought if she brings it up, mm-hmm. I will follow up. If she yeah. does not, 
I'm gonna leave it alone. Yeah. So, okay. Um, but something I also didn't consider was you saying you getting stares, which um, uh, I, I can you just talk about uh, you being handicapped? Uh, if you can explain how much or how little you want on that. Yeah. So when I was 13, I was, I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma. It's a bone cancer. And so long story short, uh, I was really into gymnastics. And I remember one day I was doing flips in the parking lot and in the middle of one of my flips, my femur bone snaps in half. And it turns out that there was a tumor about that big that had been eating through my femur bone for God knows how long. And um, it just, it finally gave out in that moment. So that was a wild ride. I remember when I went to the hospital, um, they asked me numerous times. I was getting really irritated because they kept asking me what happened. I didn't realize that it was because they were trying to see if I was being abused because I was 13 at the time. I see. Because they said, they explained to my parents that the break was so bad, it looked like I had gotten hit by an 18 wheeler. Um, So um, I got transferred to St. Jude, which is a children's hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. I don't know if you've heard of it or not, but yeah. Yeah, you have. Okay, yeah. It's an awesome hospital. if you're going to deal with childhood cancer, I would hope that you would be able to be in the care of St. Jude and their doctors because it's a, they tried to make the most out of everything. And like me, I was in traction. So they had a, a rod going through my leg, um, pulling it straight into this weird metal thingy. I was stuck in that for about four months and I couldn't get out of bed. Um, but they had like people come in and like hang out with me sometimes. They had um, programs on the television that was St. Jude only where it was like game shows that you could participate in. Mm-hmm. Um, they had the most amazing cafeteria. You could order whatever you wanted. Um, yeah. And they also had very good morphine. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, Got you. Yeah. Long story short. So they, I went into surgery to get my femur bone replaced with a rod, um, a metal rod. But when they went in, they saw that the tumor had wrapped around the main artery and there was nothing that they could do. So when I woke up, my leg wasn't there. And so, yep, I have been an amputee since I was about 13 and a half years old. Okay. Goodness gracious. All right. So, of course, you've been living with yourself for, you know, all these years. So um, this isn't your first time telling this story. But, you know, for me, it's, you know, all brand new. So, all right. um, I'm very sorry you had to go through that. I am sure uh, the mental toll that it takes on not only yourself, but your family. I am glad you are here talking to me. Um, You you. look like (laughs) you look like you're in good spirits. So. (laughs) All right. So I, I want to ask a couple questions. Yep. So what was the transition like? Because this is a very clearly very unique circumstances. How are you feeling when you're going through all of this, specifically when you realize I don't have a leg? I don't have one of my legs, excuse me. <laughs> um It was definitely very traumatic of an experience, but they did put the idea in my head that it could lead to an amputation. Um, So that was in the back of my head. Honestly, by the time the amputation happened, I was so exhausted and tired from everything that I was going through because I'm a Jehovah's Witness and I don't accept blood transfusions according to my belief in the scriptures and what and how God feels about it. And so my main goal was wanting to make sure that I was good in my relationship with Jehovah God. Um, now, unfortunately, in the hospital, they they believed that it wasn't my idea to abstain from blood. They believed that my parents were making me do it. So that was that also took a very big mental toll on me. Um, fighting with them over that. I mean, at one point they even tried to take me away from my parents. 
Um, so like going through all of that at 13 and then like cherry on top, I wake up and my leg's not there. Like Mm -hmm. I'm tired. (laughs) I don't feel like dealing with this anymore. (laughs) And I remember I, um, I woke up, cried, went back to sleep. And then I woke up again and I was in the hospital room and, um, a childhood friend of mine, actually, she used to be my babysitter. She, I woke up and I saw her and she was crying over me, you know, just saying like how sorry she was. And I was like, you know what? It's okay. I'll, I'll get it back. And I went back to sleep Mm -hmm. um, because that's another hope that I have and what the Bible promises as a future paradise where there won't be anyone that's sick. There won't be anyone that's handicapped. And so I have that to look forward to. And I know that my hope is that I will get my leg back and it will happen. So that at, at that point, it just was what it was. And I leaned on God the whole time and I let him carry me. I feel like I'm at the assembly. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously. I feel like, like there should be a round of applause. So <laughs> thank you for, for sharing that. Now, uh, you mentioned the stairs. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that I did not consider. Didn't even come across my mind. Adjusting to that. And you said you still get them anyway. So how did you adjust to being out in public? Um, even navigating uh, to your new circumstances? Ooh, I hated it so much because I don't like being perceived. I hate it so much. (laughs) But I mean, what can you do? Like people are going to stare regardless. And I think one of the things that I had to come to terms with is people don't always stare because they have bad intent. Sometimes they stare just because they're curious. And I thought about how when I was little, I remember this was back when we lived in Arkansas, so I was really little. And there was um, a man in front of us in line at Walmart. And I was with my mom. Now, in that part of Arkansas is rural, so there are a lot of farmers. And farmers are always missing their fingers. And mm-hmm. so when I saw him, and I saw that he didn't have any anything but like two fingers, I went to my mom and I was like, Mom, Mom, look, look, he has, look, he has two fingers. And she was like, shut up, Morgan. And (laughs) I thought about that moment and I was like, okay, when I saw that, I didn't think that that man was disgusting. I wasn't judging him at all, but I saw something that I hadn't seen before. And that was interesting to me. And I wanted to tell somebody about it. I stared. And so when people stare at me now, I mean, I have good days and I have bad days, but Um, for the most part, I just try to understand, like, people are going to be curious and this is, this might not be something that they've seen in someone before, especially someone so young. So that could probably be why they're staring. And I try to be understanding about it. Now that's on my good days, Mm -hmm. on my bad days, I will, I will stare at them back. Um, (laughs) I will death glare. I've gone off on a couple of people, (laughs) some really bad days. (laughs) Uh, so it, yeah, it depends. I will say though, I'm not a completely mean person. When I did go off on those two people, it was for a good reason. Her, it was a mom and her two sons. And these two sons were old. They were old enough to know better. Mm-hmm. They looked like they were about between 10 and 12. Um, and they, I remember I was in line um, for a museum And this was a foreign country, so I tried to take that into consideration, too. But there really wasn't any excuse. They kept trying to look under my skirt. And their mom was just standing there, not doing anything about it. That's when I went off on the kids and her. (laughs) It's like, I don't care if you only speak French. You don't understand the look of what I'm saying. You need to. (laughs) You don't understand. (laughs) I I think any anybody with with a brain uh, could understand uh, why you would do that. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's hard enough. And and that's the thing. Um, I, like I say, I can only imagine being 13, you're like going into like your real teenage years too. Like it's, it's, you're not just, not just dealing with, uh, your, like your, and- yeah, yeah. Like you're, you're dealing with a lot mm-hmm. all at one time. So, um, that's what's up. I have a I have a high level of respect for you. 
and uh everything that you've that you said and um i i think i think people can take uh, encouragement from some of the things that you said because sometimes we can get wrapped in our own bubbles wrapped in our own worlds sometimes we could think it's the end of the world but mm -hmm. there are people who have been through more there are people who've been through worse and they're That's still hard. Here, look at you. You do your makeup. You be putting your fits on. You're, you know what I'm saying. You got the uh, what's her name from X Men? Is it Jean Grey? Something oh, like that. Oh, you're talking about Storm. Yeah, Storm. Storm. Yeah. No, no, Rogue. 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 There we go. You got the Rogue thing going on. So, <laughs> you, you know what I mean. So, uh, come on, folks. So, all right. Um, and transitioning into some some more music things and. Uh, the person who we have in common today, which brings us together. Um, I mentioned that I first saw you um, in the Habits short film. Oh yeah, uh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. That was my first. Uh, that was my first sighting of of Morgan, y'all. So, uh, how do you know Jazz Yvonne? I actually met her at one of our conventions one day. It was really quick. Um, and I feel like maybe it wasn't passing. I don't know, but either way, we didn't really get closer until the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So what, just out of curiosity, cause she's Texas, you're Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Was this an international convention? No, it was a, excuse me. It was a regular one. Okay. Um, I think I was in town visiting family, um, and that's where I met her. Yeah, because all of my family, they're in Texas and Dallas, Texas, and that's where she is, too. OK, so you met Jazz um, at a convention and you picked up around 2020. So what was that just like more of an Instagram relationship, DM and back and forth, maybe some Zoom stuff? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I love... Let's see, how can I explain this? I just love being there for people, I guess. So I knew that we were both going through some things and um, she was experiencing the loss of her grandmother. And I just kind of wanted to get her out, introduce her to people. So I started inviting her to um, different Zooms that I had going on. I did some paint and sips with some of the girls that I had met. Um, and that's how we started getting closer. I would text her every now and then, check on her, and then we text back and forth and yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what was it like eventually working on the short film and how did she approach you through that you're a good friend by the way I just I don't want to ignore that but <laughs> yeah <laughs> um thank you by the way um let's see how did she approach me honestly I don't remember mm -hmm. but I remember it being a really exciting project I remember her being so stressed um, cause jazz, how she is, it's like, if something is going to get done, it's going to get done right. And I really respect that about her. Like she doesn't have to do anything if it's within her power. Um, so she worked really hard on that project and it was really fun. She has a lot of great ideas and it was so awesome seeing them all come to life. Um, I don't remember how she asked me to be in the short film, but I remember driving out to Texas Oh, wow. to to hang out with everybody and work on that with her. She had rented this really cool, I don't know if it was an Airbnb or what, um, but it was somebody's studio for something. Um, and I think like, I guess like some people will put up their studios and other um, spots to be rented out for music videos. Mm -hmm. And so that's what she did. And um, yeah, we just got to filming. She told me what she wanted. I tried to follow it as best as I could. And uh, yeah, it, it turned out pretty good, I would say. Okay. Yeah, I think it did too. But and that's interesting because I was going to ask, like, how did you end up filming? I was going to assume that you filmed around your area and sent it back to her. So that's pretty cool. So you went out there. How far of a drive is that? At the time, it was only eight hours. Huh. Yeah, not, not bad, because I was in Memphis at the time, so mm -hmm. it, was, it was a quick drive. Okay. Jeez. Yeah, it, it's seven from here to, to Tennessee. So I'm just thinking, you know, for me, just Texas, the idea of driving to Texas is crazy. So, okay, not bad at all. Wait, so, what part of Tennessee? Is it probably like the very edge of it? Honestly, 
I've only driven through Tennessee going to Georgia. Uh, okay. okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So you didn't get too far into it. Probably not. Mm-hmm. Probably not. Yeah. You're not in Tennessee that long driving to Georgia. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, all right. So go check out Jazzy Vaughn Habits short film. Um, you can also listen to it on Spotify and Apple Music. I do Apple Music, so um, I listen to it there. But you can, I'm sure you can find it on Spotify too. So um, fast forward to this project that she uh, just dropped, uh, Dark Teal, which is pretty cool. We're going to discuss it. Um, we're not going to go too in depth, but we're going to talk about it. Talk about which what touched our hearts, and and uh, maybe people can give their feedback in the comments as well. Um, but you were a part of the promotion for this project. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> she hit me up and she was like, hey, can you do a video of you covering your eyes? And I was like, sure. And I recorded and I sent it to her immediately. Um, looking back on that, honestly, I wish that I had waited just a little bit so I could at least get my nails done because them junts were like <laughs> grown out to here. <laughs> Really? See, these are things that that I, I don't want to speak for all men that I didn't notice. Good. <laughs> but now, but that's the the, the pros and cons of mentioning things because I'm going to go back because um the concept of nails. Uh, I've been married for five years. I just still don't get it. So, <laughs> what 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 women what some women may consider bad um, with nails? It's like oh that looks normal so mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll, we'll, all, we'll all collectively whoever is watching this will all collectively go watch it but mm-hmm. okay so we did see you in uh some of the promo did she give you any idea of you know outside of covering your face and then revealing it or did you was it just a surprise when you saw the full promo um she gave me an idea of what she was looking on looking to do but I definitely was surprised when I saw the promo. It came together really well. But like I said before, she always has good ideas. Yeah. All right. So this is uh this little segment's gonna be the gas up Jazzy Vaughn segment. Uh let's <laughs> let's get into some some music. Uh because we're we're introduced to Morgan, who is a, a I would say a piece of Jazzy Vaughn history. Um been <laughs> been used a couple times. So uh just we, we're not going to get too in depth because I don't want to make this an, uh, a two hour long podcast. So uh, Dark Till, Dark Till released, uh, I, I believe it was February 22nd. Uh, this is uh, a, a Jazz Yvonne original. Now, I don't know who produced all of these tracks. And uh, one thing that I do want to say is if she found these like these instrumentals, beats, I'm sure she has some connections, but her like her her beat picking is immaculate. But um, I don't want to talk too long. This is why Morgan's here. (laughs) So uh, I just want to get your thoughts on the project. Some of your um, high points, favorite songs, anything like that, that you can uh, share. Yeah, so my favorite song on the album would probably have to be, is it Resent or Resentment? Let me look. It's Resent. Resent with a period at the end. Yes. Yeah, I love that song. I probably play it about three times a day. And my brother loves that song. Like, I'm always trying to put him on to, um, like, these producers that we know, like, their music. And then he'll listen to them, but it's just kind of like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. Um, glad they had fun. Um, but when he's heard Resent, he was like, yo, tell her I said that she is good. Like, this is this is probably the best JW song that I've heard in a minute. And I was like, yeah, the, I, I love that song. And then the, the tempo switch up towards the end was yeah. chef's kiss. <laughs> Absolutely. That was a favorite of mine, too. That's like a highlight of the project and Mm -hmm. it being just like just straight jazz, because I believe um, she knows how to take a backseat, although it was it is her project. She lets others shine. But on resent period, 
like it's just all it's just all her and you get jazz in totality like she's just carrying the whole joint ain't no backseat it's no y'all are gonna get this and y'all are gonna hear me um yeah that's yeah. that's also one and it was so real too like i love the lyrics <laughs> of that one i think that's another thing another one of the things that really pulled me in a lot of times when i listen to music unless i'm just like in a really bad mood i'm listening more to the music than i am the lyrics um but after a couple of listens, the lyrics start popping out to me more. And so that's what happened with hers. Like at first I was like, oh man, this sounds really good. The beats, the bomb. Um, but after a few listens, I was like, man, the lyrics are really hitting home. And I've been there for some of the things that she's been through and some of the things that she's told me about. And so like when I heard um, what she had to say in the song, I was like, yeah, the, I don't know, it just kind of really hit home for, for me too. Um, especially the parts where she was like, you know, I'm not, I know that I'm not perfect, um, but neither are you. Like, basically, can we just be understanding and forgiving of each other? Like, wasn't I good to you? Like, can't you see past the, you know, I I, I love the, that part of the song. I love those lyrics. Yeah. Uh, I think jazz does a really good job of capturing those things. And I think the best artists are the ones who can talk about themselves or talk about something that's close to their heart, but that others can relate to as well. So, you know, she can spill out her heart. Um, I don't know if she is or isn't. There's a automatically, a, there's an automatic assumption when I listen to music that this is how the artist really feels. And uh, it's talking about, you know, wasn't I good to you, love? Wasn't I good to you? So it, it's like, I think everybody, you know, you, you probably deal with your first heartbreak um, when you're like a kid, you know, whether you liked a teacher, liked somebody who didn't like you back, or whether you're in your teenage years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you just, you know puppy love type stuff and and it goes up to your adult years none of these these things don't stop these you know heartbreak or a friendship gone sour doesn't yeah. isn't restricted to age so i think many people have felt that way or can relate to that uh i think there is a level of she talks about like to me she talks about in this song like being more self-aware self-aware watching what you say um whether it's because not to say that she's unfiltered at some points, um, but sometimes you just have to watch what you say for the sake of others. They can't yeah. take your personality, so on and so forth. So oh, that's why she did start the song off like that. I took a lot of people off when I speak my mind. Yeah. There we go. <clears throat> and one thing um, that I want to add to that too, because she was teasing this like Basquiat quote, up until the project dropped and um, you hear it at the end of the song. Um, and I looked it up today when I was at work <laughs> um, uh, where he's saying like uh, the interviewer is asking him, are you angry inside? And he oh, says like, uh -huh. yes. And mm -hmm. he's like, what are you angry about? And he like, there's a pause and he says, I don't know. Um, but I watched that and it was really short. It was like, Basquiat, he was like, he was modeling for Como de Garcon and also did an interview. And I did not know that clothing line went back that far. But uh, he, he mentioned like not wanting to be like a big celebrity because all celebrities are like built up by the public, then torn down which is true, mm -hmm. but I, it might be a stretch and you know, jazz way more than me. Um, I, I found a correlation to jazz saying like, she likes being kind of behind the scenes than like all in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. um, so if I was to like draw a comparison, it's like two people who want to be kind of reserved, um, not too accessible to the public, you know, not being in the public eye that much. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's my soliloquy. Yeah. Um, any yeah. other, <laughs> uh, but yeah, any other highlights um, uh, that you enjoyed, wanted to mention? Um, I really like the song switch up on the very first song that she did with Crowded Places. Mm 
it was at like the two two minute 14 second oh maybe two minute seven second mark where the song did kind of a switch up i love that part of the song mm-hmm. i love the second the second half of that especially um that's one thing that i feel like she does um a few times during the album she gives you plenty of ear candy to work with and like she doesn't let your mind get bored with the beat because it just does a, a switch up mid song and mm-hmm. whether that's like a change of flow a change of the tempo i really like that kind of stuff yeah yeah i agree um I think this is in my overall thoughts paragraph in my notes here, but jazz's music to go along with what you were saying, it transcends just being like, oh, that's like a good Jehovah's Witness track. Like, no, like it sounds, it sounds like really, really good. Like it transcends. I'm supporting a friend. No, like I'm going to listen to this because the music is really, really good. Right. And those beat switches, those tempo changes are a real contributing factor to her music being great. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, the features as well. Um, Whoever this Blizz guy is, shout out to you because you sound amazing. He sounds Um, bomb. Yes, you sound bomb. (laughs) uh like sounds like a like like i say like i i i hate to say you don't sound like one of jehovah's witnesses but like you sound like a studio artist okay they need to put him on the broadcast (laughs) (laughs) seriously like he he sounded so good in that song nonchalant that he's on Mm -hmm. um you know him on him on the hook uh, along with jazz on the hook, like it was a nicely constructed hook. This life is so crazy. You know, however it goes, I'm not going to sing it because I'm not as good as them. But <laughs> uh, like they really executed that song well. So I just want to give a shout out to him, to uh, Dirt, to other artists on the on the B. McFerrin song. Uh, and of course, my dog, Crowded Places. That's my that's my that's my brother, man. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Didn't you do an interview with him at one point? Yeah, that's my dog. <laughs> we, yeah. Oh, y'all are cool in real life. Yeah, yeah. That's my man. Oh, that's <laughs> we, so cool. we, we grew up together. That's so cool. I actually um I hung out with his cousins a couple of years ago because my roommate is is she related to them? No. They're like family friends. Interesting. The um, everybody's connected somehow. Yeah. Is it is it the are they female cousins? Yeah, Victoria, she did his album cover with the airplane. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, this world is small, like small Very. world for real. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> I interviewed her too. Oh, uh, really? Way, yeah. This was 2020, 2021, something like that. So, uh, okay. yeah. Interesting. This is a small world. So, were you on like the East Coast? I don't want to say what state they're in, but you know, you were over there or they were by your way. No, so we were over there. So um, her family friend was my roommate during the time. And she was like, oh, I'm going back home. Do you want to come with me? And I'm on this thing where I'm trying to get like, um, I'm trying to visit all 50 states. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, heck yeah. I mean, I don't really know what there is to do there, but that'd be cool to hang out with your friends. And so we all hung out. Um, We picked up some of her friends in D.C., went up to where um, Victoria and them were, picked them up. And then we all went to New York to do like the Met tour Mm -hmm. and some other things that we had planned, but it was really fun being over there. Oh, that's pretty cool. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Small world, super small world, but okay. (laughs) All right. So um, like I say, we're, we're like at the hour mark and I'm going to be a man of my word. So okay. We're going to, I'm just going to give like some overall thoughts. If you have anything else to add, um, you can, and then we can just wrap it up. So um, overall thoughts on this project, I'm just going to read it straight from the notes. Um, Excellent project that transcends listening uh, to support a friend type music. The music is great. Uh, This project discusses topics that can apply to interpersonal relationships. It tackles subjects such as loneliness, being different, and maybe even wanting to isolate. Um, one of the highlights that we've already talked about is, uh, the song re resent. 
The features are all placed and chosen well. The production is immaculate. Jazzy Vaughn knows when to take a backseat and let others shine. It's demonstrated on some of the songs that she's curated and also on her short film, being behind the camera and having other subjects, other pieces of scenery, um, you know, really get the shine. So um, those are my thoughts. Um, And Morgan, if you have any other thoughts, the floor is yours. Uh, Definitely check her out. She is a very talented person. Um, She has a lot of amazing ideas and more coming your way. I don't know how much music is coming on the way, but definitely look out for some of her film, her film stuff. Okay. And there you have it. Uh, Thank you for coming on the show. I do appreciate it. Um, Thank you for opening up. Uh, I don't know how comfortable you are with, you know, just opening up or telling your story to complete strangers, but I really do appreciate it. Um, Any other last words for anybody who wants to know Morgan? Um, Gosh, visit Japan one day. It's totally worth it. Visit Japan, y'all. And that applies to myself. So, all right. Uh, Cool Hand Podcast, something you, you got to deal with. Uh, my name is Q. This is Morgan. And we're gone. Easy. And that's it. <laughs>